Okay, ready or not, here I come is as much a warning as it is a last minute call to action. Are you battle ready? For those who have lived through a civilian or even a world war, certain experiences were known to be become commonplace. According to World War II Chronicles by Dr. Martin Jonas, the war affected every aspect of daily life and meant that everyone endured hardships and sacrifices. People's weariness with these hardships was as much a threat to popular morale as the physical dangers of war, he said. He documented that for six years, people suffered rationing of foods and dust to dawn blackouts to prevent aiding the German bombers. For Biafran war survivors, such as my parents, rationing was also a survival necessity, as well as being ever ready to move from place to place, combined with taking shelter in a bunker during times of heightened alert. It would be an exaggeration to say that COVID-19 is the world war we never had to endure, and yet I compare our experience today with those of our predecessors to show how in spite of the incomparable conditions of hardships they experienced, we're still found wanting. We are the generation that are exposed as lacking in mental and emotional stamina to endure discomfort for the sake of the greater good. Now I could postulate that this is due to our lack of social cohesion an increasingly fragmented sense of moral values. Nonetheless, we are where we are. Today we're asked to endure a lockdown, wear face masks and maintain social distancing. And many are grumbling, refuse to cooperate and even go on protests. Some conveniently, if hypocritically, query the reality of the virus or, which as far as I'm concerned is just as dangerous, they sow seeds of confusion by undertaking what amounts to a social media trial by jury amidst this global warfare. A house divided against itself, fill in the gaps. In countries like China, Japan, and Florida, we've seen what amounts to a second wave with global lessons that we would be well advised to take note of. Starting with Florida, which was one of the first states to impose a lockdown and successfully combat the virus in April. Indicators of a second wave were evident by June after they moved to ease the lockdown. In Japan, Suzuki Naomichi, the governor of Hokkaido, announced on March 18th, after three weeks of lockdown was lifted, that the region had contained the outbreak. By April 12th, less than a month later, he warned that Hokkaido was facing a crisis of a second wave and reimposed the state of emergency. In China, the mere whiff of the return of the virus was met with a warm mode response. More than 7 million residents of the city of 22 million were tested for COVID-19, while schools, bars, and beauty parlors were shot, and a forensic approach to contact tracing required that anyone who had close contact with an infected person must quarantine for 28 days. Now, the lesson from these countries is that we need to toughen up and not ease down. Stop putting our head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich. Coronavirus may well be here for us some time. We must love ourselves and our neighbors enough not to carelessly put one another at risk. Although some measures I admit are not practical to take, we must do what little we know to do and be consistent with it. And whereas government agencies mustn't grow wary of sensitizing the citizenry, out of sight mustn't become out of mind. We all must consistently mentally arm ourselves for a drawn out battle. Yeah, um, Ikine, it's, it's, um, they say in the absence of information, rumor tribes, and um, when rumor tribes, even intellectuals are turned to convey your bets. And um, if you look at the way, you know, those people who are supposed to sensitize the rest of us, the way they have handled this COVID, it has, more, uh, it has been more of a scandemic than a pandemic. It has, more, it has been more of COVID-419 than COVID-19. And so, when you are not able to pass the message, they say action speaks louder than words with your action. Look at, um, in the course of the week, if you see the traffic on Todd Bridge, even on that um, Akbongbo Bridge and Sulere Aziz, you now begin to ask yourself, you know, so where are these people going and where are they coming from? And because the attitude of government to all of these things is as if COVID has disappeared from Nigeria. So, and then you also hear, you only hear of breaking news when one as governor or one rich man dies of COVID. You don't hear of the ordinary man. So the impression, the message it passes that is a sickness of big man. And then the attitude, the government that tells you wear fixed masks, you see police jam packed in a van, no fixed masks. You see last man, all of them sandwiched in a van, 
no face mask. These are people who are supposed to be sensitizing. Mm -hmm. And so it looks as if, you know, this is a punishment to the rest of us. Meanwhile, this will protect the ordinary people. And then you go to hospitals. Any, every patient is COVID-19 patient. There are no explanation for it. You know, information is missing. And so when people hear, hear of this, there's self-medication. There are even the available um, isolation centers, you know, you get there, the, imagine Lagos State coming out to tell us that they feed or that they, they, they are feeding or is it treating one patient with 100,000 to 1 million, 1 million naira mm -hmm. per day. Okay, no, they clarify that. You know, people so, picked out that bit. Yes, yeah, so that that's what I'm saying. So when you hear stuff like that, because of social media, you should be careful the kind of information you pass mm -hmm. to the people. And so in the midst of hunger, you hear of uh, NDDC, you know, how people are spending yeah. money to sensitize COVID. Mm -hmm. And then you begin to ask yourself, Maybe this COVID is actually an opportunity to make money. To make and money. so that's why government, are I, I like your advocacy, let government step up, not just with campaigns and slogans, but with their action. The actions yeah. will send more message than the slogans. Rookie U.S., I agree <laughs> with Libras. <laughs> the the 4 9 approach in Nigeria is really startling. To be honest with you, we can't really ask people to lock down and don't have any source of income, no social welfare. Like I was talking on TV the other day, um, Canada was giving $2,000 a day for every worker who had um, um, had um, like a tax returns the previous year for the low income workers. And businesses were giving $40,000 loans with a 10,000 forgiveness if you pay back early in two years. And it was an interest-free loan. So when you do things like that, people can actually adhere to what you're preaching. Now, when a man has nothing to eat and there's no source of income and you tell them to stay home and lock down, they'll think, is it better for me to die of hunger or to die from COVID-19? And so they don't really, they can't adhere. So what are we doing in Nigeria to ensure that we do real palliatives that are reaching people, not the NDDC type where they share the money to themselves first? And meanwhile, they're having their full salaries and their full benefits and giving travel allowances to places that don't even exist mm -hmm. when they're locked down internationally. What am I saying? If you want to um, implore people to obey you, you have to support them. You have to be compassionate with them. There's a lady that just came on TV, I'm sure you heard her, saying that if you take chloroquine, you won't yeah, catch Dr. COVID. Stella. So therefore, don't wear face masks. I think that is absolute, really dangerous okay. to do that because let, let, there's no evidence that shows that. So, uh, you, you see, the way I see it is that I agree with all of you that there's a, the, the, this attitude to COVID-19 makes it look like a scam. First of all, you have a president who is almost 80 years old and he has refused to wear a mask. He's in a very dangerous age bracket. Um, he he could wore drop one off. the other day. He could drop <laughs> off. Yeah, he wore it to Mali because they wouldn't have probably let him into Mali if he didn't wear it. That's, <laughs> that, that, you, that, that's the saddest thing that you know, has happened in the COVID thing for me. Mm. If the president looked like somebody who feared COVID-19, the message would get around better. Look at Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson actually looked like somebody who really wanted to get rid of this COVID. And he caught it. Caught it, mm. went through it, came out. Maybe it helps that he's a very bushy kind of person that doesn't look like he's looking after himself and all he just wants to do is to work, even if many will say he's not working. But that's a matter of, you know, <laughs> opinion, because I think Politics. it is. And um, that's much better. But when you have the president who simply will not wear it at his age, then why do you think um, a strong last man, man uh, will fear COVID-19. Okay, David. Well, I mean, from an international point of view, like what, how it's handled in Nigeria and how it's handled outside of Nigeria are two very different things. Mm -hmm. I think like what the example you, you referenced in the US, for example, where people are having protests over wearing masks. Even, yeah, even I in think, the UK, would you yeah. believe? Yeah. I think these are first world problems. I think they probably, their problem is that they have light. Yeah, <laughs> they have, they too. have, they have they, too much freedom. Pretty much. So because... Like in this part of the world, I think we're already used to inconveniencing ourselves to a certain extent. Even but, just, but even among people I know, just they just don't living, wear face masks. They don't well, the thing is, distancing. the thing is, if if they were, and they know better. If it was enforced, if they were required to in this they part of the world, they wouldn't go out and protest. They would just grumble. But what I'm saying is, like, we do don't it. know enough now but to do the right thing. That's what I was saying. Well, I mean, <laughs> why do Nigerians not think it's? You don't want real. to inconvenience yourself. That's my own assessment. Well. Kenneth speaks of a drawn-out battle, whereas some of us were born in the battlefield. We are born ready. I'm set to kick into action after the break. <laughs>